A local war in Europe turned into a war of many nations, the Great War. 20 million people would die worldwide in this conflict. This document will dive into World War I from the American perspective. Welcome to Lessons in Humanities. For PowerPoints, Google Slides, primary source activities, full year curriculum bundles, and other teaching and learning materials, visit the Lessons in Humanities store. The link to the store is in the description below. In 1914, the assassination of Franz Ferdinand from Austria-Hungary sparked a chain of events that would lead to World War I. This world war had effects that would last for decades. Empires ended and new countries were created. Modern weapons like machine guns and U-boats and mustard gas were used for the first time. And the United States would enter this war in 1917. And by the United States entering the war, it showed that the U.S. was a world power. Look at this timeline, you will see that World War I was between 1914 and 1918. Before and during this time period in the United States was known as the Progressive Era, which was an answer or a change caused by the Industrial Revolution in the United States. And after World War I will be the Roaring Twenties. The causes of World War I. There was a buildup of military forces in Europe prior to the first shots fired in World War I. There were also lots of alliances that were meant to keep peace, but these alliances actually divided Europe into two. There was also imperialism. European nations competed for territory around the world, which increased tensions. For example, each country criticized other countries for being overly greedy. There was also a lot of nationalism, support over one's own nation, over the interest of other nations. And this nationalism led to the military buildups. But the immediate cause was the assassination of the heir to the Austro-Hungarian throne. Prelude to war. Late in the 1800s, the German Empire was becoming more and more powerful. At that time, there were decades of peace in Europe. In 1888, Wilhelm II became emperor, or Kaiser, in Germany. Uh, he was the grandson of Queen Victoria from Britain, and he admired the British Empire and its royal navy, so he wanted to build up its navy. And Britain and other nations felt threatened by the rise of this uh, rising Germany's more powerful Germany. The strategic moves of Wilhelm and the rise of Germany at this time in the late 1800s created new systems of alliances that watched over Germany's expansion. It was these alliances which is going to cause or make the war even worse because people are going to support each other and the war is going to turn into a world war, not just a local war. Now let's talk about these alliances. Well, first there is the, uh, the it's an alliance system that was supposed to keep the peace, but it made the war much worse. So there's first the Triple Alliance, which was the Central Powers, and then the Triple Entente, which was the Allied Powers. So the Triple Alliance was Austria, Hungary, and Germany, and Italy, but Italy would later fight for the Allied Powers or the Triple Entente during the war. And the Triple Entente, which would be the Allied Powers, was Russia, France, and Britain. So if, this, if you look at this map, you can see the Triple Alliance, and you can see the Triple Entente. And again, these are the alliances before the war, right? So the Triple Alliance is going to be called the Central Powers during the war and after, historically. And the Triple Entente was the, the Allied Powers. So the Triple Alliance, uh, you know, they made this alliance just to support each other. Uh, they were worried of, of a Russian attack because the Russians were becoming more powerful. And Italy was also looking for some type of support against the French. So they joined this one originally. But when the war started, Italy would not fight with the Triple Alliance or the Central Powers. And the Triple Entente, or the, what would become the Allied Powers, that was Russia uh, and, and France originally, right? 
uh, and they create this defensive allied uh, uh, forces or al alliance to protect against the Germany, Austria, Hungary, and at first the Italy um, alliance, but Italy will come to the allied powers later. Uh, Britain didn't want to join the alliances, but when Germany was building up its navy, they decided to join this one as well. So again, just to reiterate what I just said, the Triple Alliance was the Central Powers. Uh, that would include Austria-Hungary and mostly in Germany. Uh, and uh, it wouldn't include Italy, which is on this map, because Italy is going to go to the Allied Powers. And the Allied Powers, or the Triple Entente, was Russia, France, and Britain. And there were more countries involved, but these were the major countries. Austria-Hungary expanded in Europe, which really worried a lot of people because they're expanding into the Balkans, which is southeast in Europe. And some of those nations were Slavic nations and Russia was protector of these nations. And uh, this really made the Russians angry. And by them expanding and going into these Slavic nations, the Russians were keeping an eye on it. And uh, they started to take some nations in, in, the, in the Balkans area and they were looking towards Serbia and Russia was watching this. And remember, if one war between two countries starts, there's an alliance system and it would expand to other ones protecting other nations. You know, like the domino effect. Take a look at this map. This is in the Balkans, which is part of Southeast Europe. And this is Austro-Hungarian Empire, which was expanding and making people worried in Europe at the time, just like the Germans were uh, becoming more powerful, so were the Austro-Hungarians, and they started to take more territory. And they started to take some Slavic nations in the Balkans area, including Bosnia and Herzegovina, which was Slavic, and they were starting to look towards Serbia. So in 1908, they took Bosnia and Herzegovina. And in 1914, they were looking towards Serbia, and of course, this is a Slavic nation, and there was this worry of Russia getting involved because they felt they were the protector of Slavic nations in the Balkans. On June 28, 1914, a Serbian named Gavrilo Princip assassinated Archduke Franz Ferdinand and his wife, the Grand Duchess Sophie in Sarajevo, which was in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Now, this is going to start World War I. The Serbian Gavrilo Princip did this because of Austrian-Hungary expansion, but Austrian-Hungary is obviously not going to be happy that the heir to the throne was assassinated. So this is going to turn into uh, a local war. Uh, Austria-Hungary is very, uh, very angry, and they wanted to attack Serbia in retaliation for this assassination. And the key here is, remember, this is just a local war between Serbia and Austria-Hungary, but it turns into much more. Now, the point of this lecture is to talk about the American perspective. And most Americans did not want to get involved in war. So with the assassination and the looks of something starting in Europe, the U.S. wanted to stay away. And you have to remember, some immigrants because there's a lot of immigrants in the United States at that time and throughout American histories, they supported the Allied powers and some supported Central powers. It depended on their heritage. Now, the president at that time was Woodrow Wilson. He was smart. He was arrogant. He was also progressive. He was a Democratic president, and he defeated Theodore Roosevelt and William Taft in the election of 1912. He disagreed with Roosevelt and Taft's foreign policies. He saw them as imperialistic. He believed in what was called moral diplomacy, where they would support countries that had the same belief in like democratic values. And the United States was getting stronger when Wilson took office, before he took office, actually, underneath Theodore Roosevelt, and up until when he became president. Uh, and they had a lot of interest in Europe, trading partners and whatnot, but they didn't want to go to war. So American intervention, uh, you know, for the first hundred years, the U.S. didn't really intervene in, in other nations' business. That was the, um, the feelings of George Washington, who was, who was president. Uh, but in the 1800s, the U.S. Was, was busy building and managing its industrial economy. It became one of the most industrialized countries in the world. 
Uh, and it had a small military, but by the end of the 1800s, the military was growing and getting stronger. It built up the modern navy. I uh, had uh, new technology technologies available to it. Airplanes by the early 1900s, I guess, of course. Uh, motor vehicles, submarines in the early 1900s. And again, it was Theodore Roosevelt who was largely to, to blame for this or to give credit to. Yeah, it depends on how you look at it. Uh, but the army was still not that strong, but it was getting much, much stronger. And uh, But that didn't mean that the Americans wanted to go to war. So the United States was going to stay neutral. We wanted to be neutral in fact, as well as in name, when the war broke out in Europe. But the United States had good relationships with Britain and France. And a lot of Americans, they thought victory for the Allies was very, very important, even though they didn't want to fight in it. Uh, the U.S. gave Britain and France more loans and supplies than Germany during World War I. Uh, by 1916, they had uh, trade with the Allies' powers had tripled, while with the Central Powers was less than 1%. They're selling munitions and war supplies, and this was a booming business. Uh, so though the United States was not militarily ready to fight, it had the top industry in the world at that time, and it produced one-third of the world's manufactured goods. So uh, it was supporting the, the Allied powers, but not fighting it in the war. So back in Europe, the war spreads. So let's see how it spread. Because remember where, where we were earlier with the assassination of the the heir to the Austro-Hungarian throne. Uh, it, was a, it, was a, it was going to be a local war, it looked like, just between Austria-Hungary and, the, and Serbia. Uh, and, United, and the United States was busy with other things. <laughs> it wasn't going to get involved, certainly at this time. But after the, the assassination, Germany secretly agreed to support Austria-Hungary. Uh, and Germany urged Austria-Hungary to move quickly while the world was still sympathetic for the death of Archduke Ferdinand. Then on July 23rd, 1914, Austria-Hungary gave Serbia, Serbia a list of ultimatums. They said, you have to do many, many things that the Serbians were not going to do. They knew it. So it was kind of an excuse to go to war, right? Uh, so they gave him this ultimatum, and Serbia... As expected, was unable to meet the demands, which was, was known. And on July 28, 1914, Austria-Hungary declared war on Serbia. And then a complex web of alliances turned what could have been or should have been a local war into World War I. Okay, take a look at this page. And I'm going to try to explain this alliances that turned a, a local war into a world war and i'll try to make it as simple as possible so first we have the central powers austria hungary and germany which were the main powers there were more countries that fought for them like the ottoman empire and bulgaria uh, but these were the main ones and then the allied powers like we spoke about earlier was the the original triple entente which included serbia in Russia, France, Belgium, and Britain. And of course, there are more as well. Uh, the, the, the United States is going to join the Allied powers in 1917. But at the beginning, it's going to be Austria, Hungary, and Serbia. So on July 28th, 1914, Austria, Hungary declares war on Serbia because of the assassination of Archduke Ferdinand. Now, Serbia, Austria, Hungary, basically all of Europe knew that Russia would retaliate because they were the protector of Serbia. So Germany declares war on Russia because Russia was preparing war against Austria, Hungary. Now on August 3rd, 1914, Germany declares war on France because it knew a war with Russia meant a war with France. And on August 4th, 1914, Britain declares war on Germany because Germany went through Belgium to attack France. So 
that can be a little bit difficult to understand, but it was a, a domino effect. Everybody decided to defend everybody, and then, and then when one country attacked another country, they would have their defenders join the war, and it turned into a, a big world war. Um, what is not on this page, of course, is uh, the, you know, a little bit later, austria Hungary is going to declare war in Russia, right? Uh, and Britain and France are going to declare war on the Ottoman Empire. And then, of course, in 1917 is when the United States declares war on Germany. So it's a complex web of different countries supporting each other that is going to make this into a world war. And later you'll see people try to avoid alliances uh, after this war because they don't want something like this to happen again. Now, uh, I show you this map just so I can show you two of the, the major fronts. There's the Western Front and the Eastern Front. So the Western Front was mostly German, uh, Germany versus Britain and France. And then the Eastern Front was mostly uh, Germany and Austria-Hungary versus Russia. There were more fronts, there were more battlefields, but these were some of the major fronts for this war. Now, let's start with the Sklyphen plan. This was Germany's plan. Uh, Germany expected to take it to uh, expected to take time for Russia to mobilize and to get into the war. So the Germans sent troops through Belgium so it could attack France. And of course, that's why Belgium uh, got into the war. That's why Britain got into the war. Uh, Germans wanted a quick offensive victory in France, which was on the Western Front, while being defensive against the Russians on the Eastern Front. And the Germans would then move their forces to Russia. So instead of a two-front war, Germany wanted two one-front wars, if that makes sense. Now, Germany didn't go through the common border of Germany and France because of French fortifications. And Germany entering Belgium broke Belgium's neutrality, and that's what got Britain into the war, and that's, that was a big mistake. And the, and the Russians were much quicker to mobilize than expected, which I wrote down here. So... Uh, the Sklyphon plan did not work. Russia mobilized faster than the Germans expected, which stopped the plan, hindered the plan. And Russia invaded German-held uh, areas of the East, Prussia and Poland, uh, but were stopped by German and Austro-Hungarian forces at the Battle of Tannenberg, which was August 1914. This was the first major battle of the war. And despite the loss for Russia, the battle forced Germans to move uh, two corps from the Western Front to the Eastern Front, causing Germany to lose in the first battle of the Marne in the West. So between 1914 and 1916, Russia made some offensive moves, but was unable to break through German lines. With battle losses, economic hardships, and scarcity of food, Russians and their discontent towards the leadership in Russia, Tsar Nicholas II in the Russian Empire. Now, uh, I mentioned something about the, the, the Battle of the Marne. Uh, this was on September 6th to the 12th of 1914. Uh, the French and the British confronted the invading Germans in the northeast of France. And the Germans had invaded and passed through Belgium and was within, thir was within 30 miles of Paris. And while passing through Belgium, they left death and destruction in their wake. Uh, and the Germans were, were defeated, right? Remember, they had to send some reinforcements to the east, so that's going to hurt them in the west. And German chance for a quick victory on the western front was over, and the Sklyphon plan was over, right? Uh, and at this time, both sides started digging trenches three days uh, after this battle. And the importance of this battle is, number one, the Sklyphon plan was a failure. Uh, it was supposed to be a quick victory, the war could have been over quickly, they thought, but it, it, it was a failure. And of course, after invading Belgium, um, the, the, the Germans were pushed back uh, because the British were going to join, and it's going to start years of trench warfare. So this is an important point when we talk about World War One is trench warfare. This was between 1915 in 1916. Uh, so without a quick victory, uh, there was bloody trench warfare for more than two years. So due to the advanced technology, like machine guns, uh, 
soldiers had to dig into trenches to protect themselves. And in between these trenches was known as no man's land. And there was barbed wire and very dangerous people firing upon people in, in no man's land. And millions died and nobody advanced for months. Stalemates. British and French offenses gained nothing except casualties. So just imagine digging these trenches and just sitting there for years and nothing happened. It was a war of attrition, which was gradually reducing the enemy, but nobody nobody was winning. It was just a stalemate. Uh, and that, that's just, this is an important part of World War One to understand. Uh, so here's some pictures of of those trenches from from the from from the sky. Uh, they were mainly in the Western Front and did not develop in the Eastern Front. So this line here shows where most of the trenches were, uh, and they ran from the English Channel to uh, the Northeast France to to around Switzerland. An interesting story is during the first Christmas in 1914, five months after the war had started, the French, British, and German soldiers met in no man's land to exchange gifts, to sing Christmas carols, and to uh, even play soccer. Some people played soccer together. Uh, some soldiers during the Christmas of 1915 also met to celebrate with the enemy. But by 1916, the war was too bitter and nobody met. Now, here's another battle. It's the Battle of the Sanzo. So while the Western Front was in a stalemate, so remember there was some fighting in the East and in the West, but then it turned into a stalemate in these trenches. There was another front, other than the Western and Eastern Front, which was called the Italian Front. And the Italian Front opened shortly after Italy joined the war, but they didn't join with the Central Powers, who they were allies before. They joined with the Allied Powers. The triple entente. And battles took place in Austria Hungary and Italy. They took place shortly after Italy joined the war. Um, and in base guys should mention that they joined the Allied powers because they thought they would win the war. Uh, and they also thought they would get territorial gains by helping the Allied powers. But the battles of battles is plural, I should say, of Isanjo was a series of twelve battles between Austria Hungary and Italy. Uh, Germany would send troops to help Austria Hungary as well. Uh, but Austria Hungary would defeat Italy. And Italy kept fighting though and successfully held a line uh, in northeast Italy. So they held the line and, and avoided uh, being taken over, but they, they, they lost these battles, it's only death rates. Now, one of the most famous battles was the Battle of Verdun. So after a long uh, trench warfare on the Western Front, Germany decided to attack Verdun, France, which was a city protected by underground forts. Germany, Germany believed that the key to winning the war was not confronting Russia on the Eastern Front, but to finally defeat the French. And Germany argued unrestricted submarine warfare and a major French loss would push the British out of the war. And Britain was powerful, so it was important for Germany to get them out of the war, right? So uh, this is the longest battle of the war. There's going to be a lot of death uh, in this war. There's, for the Germans, possibly 143,000. For the French, uh, more than 160,000. In July of 1916, the British started uh, another battle at the, about the same time called the Battle of the Somme. And they did it to take pressure off the French at the Battle of Verdun. And the Battle of the Somme would end at the same time as the Battle of the Verdun. So it was at the same time. It was purposely planned to, 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 to distract, uh, to distract the, the Germans. Uh, and it was an indecisive result at the Battle of the Somme. There was lots of casualties there as well. Uh, but in the Battle of Verdun, it was a big French victory because it was clever thinking that the British would would um, would distract the Germans in another battle at the same time. The United States enters World War One. So President Woodrow Wilson defeated Republican opponent Charles Evan Hughes. How did he do it? He did it with the slogan, "He kept us out of war." At the same time, he was expanding the military. In the following year. 
the United States would enter World War I. Now, there are different reasons why the United States joined. Now, one reason is the Lusitania. So for many decades, the superiority of the British Royal Navy was unchallenged. However, the Germans were catching up and they, had, uh, they were attacking ships in the Atlantic Ocean. While there were some battles between the British and German navies, uh, the Germans decided not to confront the British Royal Navy because they were too powerful. Instead, the Germans decided to rely on the use of U-boats, which were like submarines. And during the early years of World War I, uh, Britain, France, and Germany set blockades. And Britain stopped and seized the ships because they didn't want the blockades. And German U-boats, uh, they surprised torpedoes on these ships. And in May of 1915, Germany sent the RMS Lusitania. And this was a passenger ship, passenger liner, that had civilians going from New York to Liverpool, England. And 100 Americans died. And this greatly angered the United States. It was all over the news. And it should be mentioned that it is believed that this ship had weapons that were on board being transferred to the Allies. But here's an important point. The sinking of the Lusitania and later other American ships increased public desire for war. Uh, so the United States would enter the war almost exactly two years after this sinking. There's going to be more events that are going to, to cause it. Now, there's something called the Sussex Plans. So the Germans, they practiced unrestricted U-boat warfare and it started in 1915. This was a big strategy for the Germans because I mentioned the British were too powerful. And on March 24th, 1916, the French passenger ship, the Sussex, was torpedoed by the Germans. No Americans died. But Woodrow Wilson threatened to break diplomatic ties with the Germany. And Germany did not want the U.S. to join the war. The U.S. was getting more powerful, more industrial, bigger military so Germany did not want the U.S. to join the war. So they issued what was called the Sussex Pledge, promising to change Germany's naval wartime policy so they would not attack uh, ships, in this case, American ships. But there was continued unrestricted U-boat warfare um, by, by the Germans. So by 1917, Germans continued to feel that the only way they could win the war was through the unrestricted U-boat warfare. In January 1917, Germany rescinded the Sussex Pledge. In March of 1917, four unarmed American merchant ships were sunk. And Germany still feared the U.S. would join the war, so they needed a way to distract the U.S. And they decided to encourage Mexico to attempt to reclaim land from the U.S., uh, drawing the U.S. into a conflict with uh, Mexico. That was Germany's plan, and that's going to backfire. This is called the Zimmerman Telegram. So as the... Um, the Russian Revolution took place. This is happening at the same time that the Russians are going to have to leave the war. Uh, Germany continued uh, its submarine warfare. And Germany feared continued submarine warfare would bring the Americans into the war. So, uh, you know, like, like Lusitania or other ships made the, the U.S. angry and Germany was worried about that. But they thought they had to keep shooting down ships to, to win this war. Uh, so they wanted to distract the Americans. So a diplomat by the name of Arthur Zimmerman, a German, sent a coded telegram to the German ambassador in Mexico offering to support Mexico in regaining Texas, New Mexico, and Arizona from the U.S., which used to belong to Mexico. And the United States uh, intercepted this telegram, and they... Uh, when the British received the message, they were very happy to share it with the Americans. It was actually the British who, who, who intercepted it. And they, they shared it with the Americans because they know that it might bring the U.S. into the war to help them. Uh, and the United States was very angry about the Zimmerman telegram. And this is going to, again, gain massive support from the American public to, to join the war. And... That's what they're going to do. So in 1916 and 1917, President Woodrow Wilson uh, worried a German victory would create a power shift in Europe and be dangerous for the world, right? 
German submarine warfare and the Zimmerman telegram angered Americans and more were pushing for the U.S. to enter the war. And on April 4th, 1917, Congress declared war on Germany. The war was 3,000 miles away, and the United States Army was not prepared. Uh, it would take the United States some time to train and equip the Army uh, in order to go to the Western Front. But the key point here is the U.S. is in the war, and they are going to need people to fight. So they have the Selective Service Act and men between the ages of 21 and 30 to register for compulsory military service. And they had to be physically fit. Now I want to discuss the, the 92nd and then the 3rd Division. So during World War I, uh, black soldiers were segregated from white soldiers and often delegated to, to menial roles, like transporting materials or digging trenches. Um, and receiving criticism of treatment of black soldiers, the U.S. military formed two black combat units called the 92nd and 93rd Divisions. France requested reinforcements, and the U.S. sent the 93rd Division to fight with the French. Now, there's something called the Committee on Public Information. So Woodrow Wilson put the muckraker um, by the name of George Creel in charge of the Committee of Public Information, and sometimes called the Creel Committee. And as the United States slowly raised its army, it created extensive pu publicity and propaganda campaigns. Uh, these campaigns inspired patriotism and support for the military. Uh, it, the, it used Hollywood to show the difference between democracy and imperialism, to show the need of saving Western civilization. There's also many sacrifices at home. For example, the United States Federal Food Administration, um, they had, it was a federal agency that controlled the production distribution of food in the U.S. during the World War I, and it was established to prevent the hoarding of food and fuel and encourage citizens to practice meatless Mondays or wheatless Wednesdays and gra or gasless Sundays. Uh, also, the U.S. Railroad Administration established to nationalize the railroad system during the war. Uh, this way, it could officially move soldiers from uh, induction points to training facilities and then to embark embarkation points. Uh, it could also officially move wartime supplies. There's also something called the Espionage and Sedition Act. In 1917, there was the Espionage Act. So to, to avoid traitors or spies, there was also the 1918 Sedition Act. Uh, for people that went against the country. Uh, dissenters and protesters could not publicly resist the war. Perpetrators risked imprisonment. Immigrants, labor unions, and political uh, radicalized um, were, in, those who were politically radicalized were investigated. Now, financing of the war, there were war bonds. So Americans bought these war bonds to raise money for the government and to support the Allied powers in Europe. Buying bonds became a symbol of patriotism in the United States. Now, now before the armistice, by 1917, the Allied powers could not protect themselves from the German submarines. The Germans had sunk over 1,000 ships uh, by the time the U.S. had actually joined the war. The U.S. entering the war countered the German submarine attacks it would provide a final blow to the German plans. And at about the same time was the Russian Revolution. So many Russians who were impoverished at this time, they were starving while their country was at war. In March 1917, there was what was called the March Revolution. It was when the government of the Tsar Nicholas II collapsed. 1,300 people were killed during protests. There was a provisional government that took over in Russia. Now, on November 6th to 7th, there was the Bolshevik Revolution. This was in 1917 as well. And this was a bloodless coup d'etat against the provisional government. And then Russia would go into civil war. So between 1917 and 1923, there's a civil war in Russia. And this would be the end of the Russian Empire. Uh, and it would end in 1923 with Vladimir Lenin claiming victory and establishing the Soviet Union.
uh, he would create the first communist state. But the important point here, when in terms of uh, the World War One, was Russia left the war. The Bolsheviks, the the, the, the communists, would end the war. Russia's involvement. So in July 1917, Russia had one last offensive against Germany. This was called the July Offensive, uh, and it also showed how weak the Russians were at this time. And Russia would leave World War One. They signed a treaty with Germany. Uh, and the same year that they signed this treaty with Germany to leave the war, uh, the Americans joined the war. So now Germany could concentrate just on the Western Front. Didn't have to worry about the Eastern Front. But the Americans are also in the war. So, so it's not, not all good for the Germans. Uh, so hundreds of thousands of German soldiers who were on the Eastern Front would move to the, to the Western Front. Now, there is something called the Spring Offensive. So with the Russians out of the war, the only chance the Germans had to win was to defeat the Allied powers on the Western Front before the U.S. arrived. So they wanted to stop the war before the Americans arrived. And so they quickly moved the soldiers from the Eastern Front to the Western Front. And the Spring Offensive was a series of five German attacks on the Western Front, and all five attacks failed. In August 8th, 1918, two million American forces joined Britain and France to counterattack the Germans. The Germans were pushed out of France. German army was defeated. And the, the German uh, general, Erich Ludendorff, called it the Black Day of the German army. Now there's something called the Second Battle of the Marne. So as the Germans were pushing out of France, the last chance at a victory came at the Second Battle of the Marne. And this was the last German offensive. And American, British, Italian, and French forces supported by hundreds of tanks inflicted severe casualty on the Germans. And this is a turning point in the war. The Hundred Days Offensive was when Allied forces pushed back the Germans. So uh, after some victories, like at the Second Battle of the, um, the Marne and uh, the Americans joining the war, uh, this was an offensive to push them back. And there was a series of victories for the Allies that took place after the Second Battle of the Marne, like I said. And this would actually lead to the end of the war. Now the Battle of St. Mohia. Uh, this was part of the Hundred Days Offensive and it was the first large U.S.-led offensive in World War One. It was the first use of the U.S. Army Air Service. Uh, so the U.S. Army Air Service would later become the U.S. Air Force. And it was a separate department um, later on. So though the objective was not realized, the U.S. Army gained stature and respect from the French and the British forces. And the Battle of St. Hill led to the New River Argonne Forest Offensive, which I will talk about next. So this was also a part of the Hundred Days Offensive, and it was a final Allied offensive. And it was the largest offensive in the United States history. It was the second deadliest battle in American history. The fatality rate uh, was 40%, and it resulted in the surrender of Germany. So the end of the war uh, had, had come, come about. Uh, German military leaders they requested Kaiser Wilhelm II abdicate. The new German democratic government, the Weimar Republic, agreed to an armistice. And on November 11th, 1918, Germany military withdrew from France and Belgium and returned to Europe. So at this time, Germany was in chaos. Uh, there was 20 million people in total who had died in World War I. Uh, about 9.7 million were military personnel, 10 million were civilians, 4.7 million Americans served, 4 million in the Army, 600,000 in the Navy, 80,000 Marines. Uh, more than 100,000 Americans died, 53,000 in battle, and then more from disease. But other Allied forces lost more people. For example, France lost 1.9 million. In Russia, between 2.3 and 2.7 million people. So it was a catastrophe. 
Now, mustard gas was used in World War I, so large-scale use of chemical weapons was a hallmark of World War I. Chemical warfare only caused less than 1% of the total deaths, but its uses caused great fear among the soldiers. And in 1925, after the war, the Geneva Protocol prohibited the use of chemical warfare. And it unfortunately has occasionally been used since the Geneva Protocol, but never as much as during World War I. At this time, there was something called the influenza pandemic. So this was during World War I. It was a pandemic and it spread throughout the world. 50 million people died worldwide. Uh, more people died from the pandemic than the actual battles. Uh, the pandemic mostly affected people between the ages of 18 and 35. Uh, it affected both the Allied powers and the Central powers. Now, people at the time or later, historically, have called it the Spanish flu because Spain was the first to report it uh, in their uncensored newspaper because they were, they were neutral. Uh, the origins of the Spanish flu are disputed. Some theories believe it started as, at a busy military camp in Kansas in the U.S. and brought to Europe. Others theorize it might have originated in France or even possibly Asia. Now, the 14 points in the League of Nations. So on December 4th, 1918, Woodrow Wilson was the first president to travel overseas while in office. Now, earlier, Wilson had proposed an association of nations that would work together to keep peace. Uh, German, Russian, Austria, Hungary, and Ottoman Empire. They're all gone after this war, and there's a new European map to be drawn. Allied forces followed German military into Germany to ensure they did not restart the war. Germany was disarmed. Now, here's a new European map. German, Russian, Austria, Hungary, um, Ottoman Empire, they were gone. Uh, notice some of the new countries like Finland, Yugoslavia, Hungary, and more. Uh, remember Gavrilo Princip assassinated Archduke Franz Ferdinand to break off Slavic provinces from the southern part of Austria Hungary and what was created was Yugoslavia. And notice how Russia was not Russia but the Soviet Union. And also notice how the Russian Empire was gone and now there's Turkey. So the European map dramatically changed after uh, the war. Now the 14 points was created by Woodrow Wilson was drafted. Uh, before the Americans even joined the war. It dealt with territory issues and long-term peace. Uh, and it included in these 14 points uh, a League of Nations, which was to keep world peace. It was, uh, quote, guarantees of political independence and territorial integrity to great and small states alike. Uh, it was a collective s security. We wanted to avoid the alliances, which made the war so much worse. Uh, now, the Allies were actually not interested in the League of Nations, and many Americans were not as well. Uh, they were more interested in guaranteeing the safety of their own nation, not like, all nations. Uh, the British Prime Minister, David Lloyd George, wanted to preserve Britain. Uh, the French Prime Minister uh, wanted reparations and limits on Germany's ability to wage war. Um, yeah, so some of the 14 points include no more alliances or secret, or at least secret alliances. International seas, seas or oceans should be free to navigate. Uh, free trade, uh, reduction in weapons, um, you know, colonial claims over land and regions would be fair. Um, Russia could form their own government. Uh, Germany would evacuate Belgium, and Belgium would be independent. Uh, France would gain, would gain territory. The borders of Italy would be established. Austria-Hungary would be allowed to continue to be an independent country. Uh, Central powers would evacuate Serbia and some of the areas that they had occupied. Uh, the Turkish people of the Ottoman Empire would have their own country. Um, Poland should be an independent country. And a League of Nations, like I mentioned earlier, would be formed to protect the independence of all the countries, no matter how big or small. So those were the, a brief overview of some of these 14 points, and it was very controversial. Not everybody liked them.
it was a treaty of Versailles, which is going to end this war. And uh, there's numerous treaties between different countries, but this was the most important one. Uh, this was between the Allied powers in Germany, uh, not Russia, because they had already left the war, right? It was signed on July 29th, 1919, at the Palace of Versailles in France. Uh, it was exactly five years after the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand. And in there, there was the War Guilty Clause. And Germany was required to disarm, make territorial concessions. All German colonies were taken away, and they had to pay reparations. Uh, it cost the Germans over $30 billion. It was really weakened, uh, already weakened Germany. And this is very important because it led to resentment in Germany, which brought about the rise of the Nazi party. Uh, at this time, Adolf Hitler was a young soldier in the German army. Uh, so that was um, going to make Germany very hurt and it's going gonna, it's gonna to lead to another war. A lot of people in the U.S. didn't like the League of Nations, which was created by Woodrow Wilson, the president. Uh, the League of Nations was included in the Treaty of Versailles, and there was much opposition to the League of Nations, uh, including Henry Cabot Lodge, who was a Republican senator from Massachusetts. Uh, he opposed it. He was kind of a vocal face, vocal voice, the face of this uh, uh, disagreement. Uh, and in fact, the League of Nations did not pass in the Senate. So 58 nations would join the League of Nations, but not the U.S. And the U.S. is the nation that came up with the idea. Now, Woodrow Wilson is going to have a stroke. So he traveled around the country promoting the League of Nations, which wouldn't pass. And while traveling, he had a stroke. He was unable to do his duties. And it is believed... Edith Wilson was making some of the big decisions behind the scenes at that time. And some have actually described her as the first female American president. And Wilson had originally planned to run for a third term, which was possible at that time. It's not anymore. But he would not be able to because of the stroke that he died in 1924. Now, the aftermath of World War I, uh, the world would change for him. Adolf Hitler. So at uh, age 25, Hitler fought for Germany in World War I. Uh, he was injured in the Battle of the Somme, and he described war as the greatest of all experiences. Uh, war reinforced his German patriotism, and he was furious over the collapse of the German war effort in the terms of the Treaty of Versailles. Uh, between 1924 and 1925, Adolf Hitler was imprisoned for sedition and he wrote Mein Kampf while there. And in January 30th, uh, 1933, Adolf Hitler was named the Chancellor of Germany. And the rest would be history, as you know. The Middle East would also change, right? So there's no more Ottoman Empire. Uh, you can look at these before and after maps. Uh, uh, the the Middle East was divided into separate mandates. So the Middle East turned into different countries created by Europeans who did not really consider the ethnic realities of the region. Uh, so ruled by Britain, Britain, France, and Turkey. So France had Syria. Britain had Iraq and Palestine and Jordan. The U.S. was asked to be a mandate but declined. And there were two new nations, like Kingdom of Hejaz, uh, which would later become part of Saudi Arabia and Yemen. So just so you know, a mandate in the context of the Middle East after World War I is an official or authorita authoritative command of lands inhabited by people unable to stand up uh, by themselves in the modern world. That's how, it was, that's how it was defined, at least. Now, at this time, there's something called the Great Migration. And, a lot, and remember, this is, this is all uh, effects from World War I. So between 1916 and 1970, six million black Americans uh, moved out of the Jim Crow South, which was segregated, uh, to the North. And it was caused by poor economic conditions, racial segregation in the South. And the migrants were seeking jobs in the North as there were labor shortages caused by soldiers leaving for World War I. Now, this is going to lead to the Red Summer of 1919. So, 
Uh, there's violence in 25 cities, and it originated from wartime racial tensions. Uh, and, um, you know, black Americans would go to the north and take jobs and it cause some tension. So when the veterans returned to the United States, they couldn't find a job because black Americans took many of the jobs. Conflicts arose. And black veterans who, who, who fought for the country or supported the, the, the cause, um, they returned and they didn't accept post-war racism after a sacrifice for, for the country. And uh, the Red Summer was from the late winter through early autumn of 1919. Hundreds of deaths and lots of destruction. There's mob violence, there's murder, and there's arson. And at about the same time was the Tulsa Race Massacre. And this was one of the worst incident, incidents of racial violence in American history. So what happened was Dick Rollin was a black suicider, and he was accused of assaulting Sarah Page, a white elevator operator. So Dick Rollin was 19, Sarah Page was 17. Some speculation that the two were actually lovers, which was dangerous in the 1920s, uh, but that's not a fact, that's some speculation. Um, but nonetheless, uh, Sarah Page did not press charges, uh, even though uh, she accused Dick Rollin of, of assaulting her. Uh, fearful that a white mob would lynch Rollin, which was more common at that time, a group of 75 armed black men arrived at the jail where Rollin was being held. Shots were fired between the white mob and the armed black men. Ten white men died and two black men died. In retaliation, mobs of white men attacked and burned what was called Black Wall Street. Uh, black Wall Street was one of the wealthiest black neighborhoods in the U.S. It is 35 square blocks that were destroyed. Uh, 1921 records suggest that 36 people died, 26 black people and 10 white people. But in 2001, there was a commission that estimated that it was more like 150 to possibly 300. So the long-term effects. Post-war instabilities would eventually lead to the Great Depression and World War II. Uh, there was a formation of the Soviet Union, which would lead to a Cold War. The Middle Eastern nations were created. But also the United States became a world power in the world. Um, at this time, Warren Harding famously promised a return to normalcy during the election of 1920. And with it came the Roaring Twenties. Thank you for watching this documentary. Again, if you want some teaching or learning materials on World War I or anything in American or world history, please visit the Lessons in Humanity store. You can click the link in the description below.